everyone here was able to sign up for the midterm, right? Yeah. And I don't mean to uh, scare people. Somebody was worried about it. Oh my gosh, you know, a two hour midterm. Um, it's an hour and 50 long because our class is usually an hour and 20 minutes. So, you know, I thought, well, the midterm should give you a full class period because that's what normally happens. But this midterm is also 20% um, uh, shorter than the normal one. So I think, it, you know, most people finish in an hour. So if you have trouble with your setup or whatever, you know, don't don't sweat it too much. Um, but uh, yeah, if we can, uh, uh, it shouldn't be too time pressured. Do you see there's any more of an emphasis on like conceptual questions or more of like the? the it's a lot like like the uh, you know the sample midterm. I mean, they're different questions, and and it, it's actually difficult in a course like this because there's so many topics that some things. You know, the same student would be really good at answering this question instead of that question, and it, you know. But but the other thing is that um, because uh, scores are generally uh, fairly low, they're like in you know sixty seventy percent is is usually sixty percent average or something. Um, that that does mean that you know yeah if you don't know something that's not so unusual. It's same for everybody else, and uh, you know what happens is as long as you do well on the other stuff, it's fine. But um, uh, normally it's, uh, okay, great. Mike is good. The main thing I'm concerned about is if, if you haven't, you know, if you've never done Zoom on your phone um, or if you haven't done the CBTF, you know, please look at it, you know, try out things and stuff. And you'll have time during the exam, but you know, it, it's sort of stressful too for the person monitoring, you know, to try to help you through all your problems and stuff. And, and, and really do try to sort of figure it out ahead of time. Try to figure out how to balance your cell phone in the right place and all those things. Uh, they have uh, reasonably good instructions. And um, if, you know, something horrible happens and you're really sick or something, well, yeah, don't take the exam and we'll work something out. But it's a, uh, it's a problem in an exam like this to give conflict exams because if I write up a different exam with questions that I think are similar, you know, and it's really hard to know if those are uh, really similar or not. And it's just, um, I prefer if everybody just takes it at the same time. And as I say, we'll, we'll do conflicts uh, one at a time. Do not oversleep. Please, you know, set yourself an extra alarm. Uh, there's always some poor soul who oversleeps and it's such a mess. Okay. So um, today's lecture, uh, yeah, so, so make sure you're familiar with CBTF. Uh, uh, FT? I don't know. Which one is it? CBTF, right? Oh, well. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Be sure you're not dyslexic and be sure you know grade scope. And uh, uh, that would be great. Um, and uh, uh, please do set an extra alarm. You know, I just, even for this class, I, I usually wake up early, but I have an alarm on my watch and an alarm on my phone. Uh, it would be hard for me um, between that and the cat, it'd be really hard for me to oversleep. Um, this lecture is going to be on the final exam, and it definitely will be on the final exam. That I can promise, because it's a really important topic. Uh, this lecture is a little bit confusing to people because it's sort of basic. And, you know, for, for a department uh, that prides itself in challenging math, uh, in an area where challenging math solves most problems, uh, you know, it's always sort of funny to look at these things and try to gain some more intuitive understanding. Uh, if that seems weird to you, well, imagine trying to ex explain this to your Aunt Agnes or trying to, you know, explain it to your favorite musician friend, right? You've got to be able to do something better than say, oh, well, see, I can prove it this way with, uh, with this theorem. Uh, You've got to be able to give some real explanation of it. Okay. So, uh, this is, this, uh, this is the final topic uh, for uh, uh, for uh, the uh, psychoacoustic stuff, and I'm just lumping this. You know, I'm calling this timbre. And timbre is a word that people use. What does timbre really mean? Well, you know, it's it's uh, not pitch. It's not loudness. And it's not duration. You know, so basically, it's sort of a, a grab bag of what's left over. And exactly how people define timbre, we could get into that, but it's it's sort of challenging, right? Because anyway, you know what it is, right? It's what it sounds like, tone color. Um, and what exactly that means is hard to define. Um, so 
uh, there is this question, you know, how do psychoacousticians, how do they study a grab bag of things, right? They like pure sine waves or narrow band noise or other things that are, you know, repeatable, straightforward experiments that, that generally test things, to be honest, that only very indirectly affect music, right? Because you don't listen to pure sine waves or narrow noise bands. You always listen to a whole aggregate of things. Uh, timbre necessarily is always an aggregate of things. So people have figured out, you know, how do you get consistent results um, testing things about timbre. One of the examples I want to give here is um, this multidimensional scaling. Has anybody done this? Because I think, yeah, m most students here haven't. Um, I occasionally get students from other departments that have seen this, but uh, it's not something that we usually talk about in ECE. But these are, I mean, and I'm not going to make you prove anything about it or even do it. I want you to understand what the idea is. And I think you can see sort of intuitively, yes, you know, once you have the idea um, that this could be implemented mathematically and realistically, this is kind of like multidimensional scaling is a bit like doing a Fourier transform, right? You, you just call the subroutine that's provided to you, except in a class you would never write your own Fourier transform. So uh, uh, there you go. So um, what is multidimensional scaling? Okay, so what you do is you do a pairwise presentation to test subjects. And you ask a question, now this is just an example, but it's a sort of generic example. You know, this is something that people really do. Um, you know, how similar are these two sounds? Now that question, of course, is, is kind of funny because you know that if you uh, have a scale from one to 10, how people will rank things, even the same things, is gonna vary person to person. But overall, you do get a pattern and you get a consistent pattern. Uh, you know, some things are correlated, some things aren't. But uh, in general, uh, you will get uh, uh, consistent results if you do thousands of, uh, of uh, pairwise sounds for each individual and you do thousands of individuals, uh, you will tend to get the same results uh, overall. So what happens here? You just, all you have is, uh, by the time you're done, thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of pairwise things and people said these were you know, on a scale from one to 10, uh, similar or different. But you got thousands upon thousands of those. Um, and then what can you do? Well, um, uh, you can draw in, in some dimensions, multidimensional scaling will uh, set it up for you uh, however you want. You say how many axes you, you want before you make the graph. So let's say we make three axes. And it will plot all these points, um, and try to make the ones that, that, that were judged very different by most people far apart and the things that were judged very close, um, close together. And of course you get a different graph. If you have four dimensions, uh, there's more freedom to place things than three dimensions, but uh, you can kind of see there's sort of uh, uh, optimal ways to place things uh, so, that th uh, so that sounds that were uh, judged as uh, quite different uh, are far apart. Um, so now it's kind of interesting. Say you just choose three dimensions. I like three dimensions because I can understand that, you know, four dimensions. Well, it, it kind of bends your brain a bit. If the fourth dimension is time, it's not too hard. But if the fourth dimension is anything else, it's kind of hard. Uh, and dimensions beyond that are hard. But say you only do three dimensions. What you'll find is one of the, um, one of the directions, I mean, it won't be lined up with the axes, but if you rotate the axes right, uh, then uh, one of the dimensions will be uh, brightness or central, uh, spectral centroid. So everybody will agree that sounds that are extremely bright are more similar to each other than uh, sounds that are not extremely bright. You know, the, uh, uh, sounds uh, where the spectral centroid is lower. Um, and another one is tonal onset. You know, things that attack fast will be more similar to each other. So you'll naturally have like the string family of instruments sort of together, because, you know, a cello sounds more like a violin than it sounds like a tuba or a cowbell. Um, but a cowbell and a woodblock, at least in one of the dimensions, is going to be pretty close. I mean, a cowbell and woodblock aren't, don't sound similar at all, but they both have fast attacks. And because of that, in one of the dimensions, uh, they, will be, um, uh, they will be near each other, much nearer than, say, the cowbell is to the tuba in that dimension. Does that make sense? So that's what multidimensional scaling is, and it's kind of cool magic math, really. 
You know, it has, a, in some sense, almost the same kind of magic that you get out of AI systems and out of other systems, right? Just that uh, you're piling in a bunch of data, and it finds, in this case, uh, you know, statistics for you, but, but it, you know, it can uh, digest it and, and show you something that you didn't know before. Right? So that's kind of cool. Now, this isn't AI at all, but, but it's, uh, uh, it's a pretty cool uh, thing. And so what does this tell you? If, if, if you do these experiments and you always have one, uh, one of the directions, in, say, in three spaces, something to do with brightness, and another one is tonal onset, well, it tells you that's a really fundamental thing about human hearing. And, you know, it doesn't really matter what kinds of sounds, if they're musical sounds or other sounds or animal sounds or anything else. Uh, this happens. So it's kind of interesting uh, that, you know, this is something fundamental about your hearing. Tonal onset is especially important. We'll see this over and over again. Um, your ear is very sensitive to spectral content of sounds, but there's also, how, what's the attack like? It's super important. How does it start? And as I'd mentioned before, um, when notes are starting on a musical instrument, there isn't standing wave patterns yet. Uh, you really don't have a harmonic series, at least not initially. So there's this time domain shape of how a thing starts, that's really important. Presumably, uh, in, in, the, in the good old days, uh, it was a survival thing, right? If you can uh, tell something um, is happening, where it's coming from, and, and if it's a dangerous sound or not, if you can do that quickly, that's probably helpful. Okay, so that's like one of the ways in which you can study uh, this weird aggregate thing and still get consistent results. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's sort of a higher level uh, kind of study. Questions about that? Okay. Uh, so I should say thanks here. Oh, I did already. Good. Um, so now we're going to do timbre analysis. So this psychoacoustic thing, you know, what's timbre? How do you analyze timbre? Well, I, I should say something here about that. So timbre analysis is interesting. You can do timbre analysis, you know, with lots of different things in mind. Uh, the thing that, that um, I really like is, is the second line here, trying to make a meaningful and manipulable representation. So what the heck does that mean? Well, you know, if we're doing electronic music, we want to mess with it. We don't just want to study it, we want to mess with it. So that's what manipulable means. So you want to be able to, you know, however you're representing the timbre, if you make some change in there, you don't want the sound to totally break or sound totally different or something. You, you know, you, you want to have something that you can mess with. So um, uh, there's a lot of different ways that you could uh, do timbre analysis. Um, so let's talk about that. Uh, spectral analysis. Okay, so you have a Fourier transform. And a Fourier transform is invertible. Every Fourier transform is invertible. You know that, right? So if you take samples and you do a Fourier transform of them, um, and then you transform it again, right? It's its own inverse, so, uh, within some constants. Uh, but uh, uh, if you, uh, you you can always invert that transform data. So you take any real signal, you do a Fourier transform of it, real signal because we're doing audio, um, do a Fourier transform of it, and then transform it back, you get the original data. That tells you that no matter how you set up your Fourier transforms, they truly represent what's there, because you can get back to the original data. But depending on how you set them up, if you change a couple of points in your Fourier transform, uh, you might be very sad. You might get something totally different back or, or you know, or whatever. I mean, uh, you, you really want to try to set it up right. So, um, so the, yeah, the transform is always invertible. So uh, if you want to, so then the next thing we do is we do a time varying spectral analysis. Now, this is a hack right from the get-go. Look, I'm talking about spectral analysis. In a Fourier transform, right, you have uh, uh, magnitude and phase uh, uh, versus frequency. So time varying, that's already subsumed in, in the idea of frequency. Like, say I talk for uh, an hour and 20 minutes today. Hey, it won't be that long today. But um, say I talk for an hour and 20 minutes today. You can take an hour and 20 minute long Fourier transform, and that will tell you everything that I said, everything that happened, and it has all the temporal information, right? If you transform that back, you're going to get, if you encode it in that magnitude and phase information, 
at all the different frequencies is everything about what I said. You get the original samples back. You get the time domain back. So you can prove just with that mind experiment, look, this hour and 20 minute long Fourier transform does represent everything I said. And it does so accurately. It's just as, you know, it's just as, uh, uh, it's just as a, a uh, uh, complete representation of what happens as the original samples. So that's fine. But now let's say you want to figure out, oh, well, did I mostly talk in a low voice and a high voice? Uh, good luck. Uh, let's say you want to look at it and you say, okay, well, uh, you know, in the last 20 minutes, did we leave early and I was actually silent for the last 20 minutes? From this one Fourier transform from the magnitude and phases, good luck looking at that, figuring that out. But it's just this mess. I mean, it, it's hard to interpret it in any way because there's just too much data in there. Yes, every event, everything is encoded by this for each, by these complex numbers, um, and you can in, inverse transform. But the, but that doesn't mean that you can use it to your to any benefit. Uh, so uh, uh, you know, the, the, like the phase information in there. What the heck? You know, you can look at this thing, and it doesn't really do you much good. So, so yes. Yeah, so there's such things as uh, doing a transform that is invertible that retains all the information, but still is pretty useless for us. So we know that. So then we do a time varying transform. What's that? What is that? We do windows of smaller amounts of time, and transform each of those. But that's sort of a hack because I just got done one transform already represents a whole thing. What are you doing making lots of little transforms? Right? You already have a time axis. Well, you don't have a time axis explicitly in the long transform, but you're representing time in some way uh, by the magnitudes and phases uh, of each frequency bin in there. So time is already sort of covered uh, in the Fourier transform, but now when you do a time varying transform, you, you're sort of artificially making this extra axis of time in addition to a frequency axis. And time and frequency, as you know, are, aren't independent things. I mean, you know, something changes over time uh, that determines its frequency content. And if something changes over frequency, that determines its time content. I mean, you know, they're not, they're not independent things. Um, that's okay. Um, go with it. So uh, uh, what we do then is we do short time transforms, but this is sort of um, this problem that time and frequency really aren't independent things. It's kind of like frequency and phase aren't independent things. You know, people always want them to be independent. Oh, I want to mess with the phase but not change the frequency of the sine wave. Well, that's not going to work. You know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and so uh, in this case here, uh, we have um, uh, short time uh, transforms. The idea there is that when you're listening to me and I'm saying ah or ooh or e, um, if you're skilled at looking at it, it's actually quite apparent what I'm saying if you look at the harmonic spectrum during the ah or the ooh or the e. And, you know, that's useful information. So if you take a short time windowed piece of sound and uh, transform that, you can get a lot more useful information out of it. And also, if you do short time windowed pieces of sound and do lots of them, if the last 20 minutes are silent, well, you can see that right away, right? There's just way more useful information in there. In fact, your hearing, you know, to some extent sort of works like this, right? If it's a short enough period of time, you hear things as different frequencies. But, you know, if you, uh, uh, if they're spread out in time, you know, you hear different events, and the different events might have different frequency content. So what you do is you do these short-time transforms. There's a lot of different ways to do the short-time transforms. Uh, you can do longer windows, which has advantages, and people do that. Or you can do shorter windows, which has advantages. Uh, you can be really dumb and not window at all, but then your data looks kind of crummy, and it, it's really hard to figure out. It's not, not useful to do that. You know from 310 you should do some sort of windowing. Um, okay. So there's a huge variety of time-varying analysis methods. I'm going to split the world into two, long window methods and short window methods. And of each of those, there's just, well, you'll see, there's lots of things you can do slightly differently. But um, uh, I'm just going to talk about long window and short window methods. Um, analysis synthesis, what is that? Well, that's when you do uh, analyze some sound, and then usually you mess with it, and then you synthesize it back. And what you'd like to have happen is that when you messed with it, something nice, you know, something that you wanted to, I mean, it might not sound nice, but it's what you wanted. You know, if, if you mess with it, then the thing that you want it to happen occurs, and you synthesize back, and there's lots of other artifacts, not lots of other junk going on. Um, so analysis synthesis is that idea that rather than just sampling, 
where you take samples. You might filter them, but that's about it. Um, uh, in this case, uh, when you uh, uh, do analysis synthesis, it's like sampling, except you change the frequency domain. And there's more, more things you can mess with in frequency domain than in time domain. Uh, so uh, uh, it makes it more uh, manipulable. And then uh, you, you change back to uh, time domain when you synthesize. Partial envelopes, partial frequencies. What's that? Well, um, you know that when you do Fourier transforms, it breaks it down into sine wave components. You know this from 310. And what we do is we call sine wave components partials. Uh, and uh, they have amplitudes and frequencies, and they have phase information. Uh, the phase information is sometimes important, sometimes not. So Mr. Ohm, way back in 1843, uh, he said that, hey, if you have a steady tone, the phases don't matter. Now, you yeah, again, have to be really careful about this. Steady tone, what does that mean? That means a sound that's exactly repeating and never changes. Doesn't get louder, doesn't get quieter, doesn't start, doesn't end. Just constant. So that's a pretty small set of things, but you know, you get an approximation there, right? If you have a synthesizer and you play a square wave on it. Um, it turns out that if that square wave's playing for a while, when it turns on, it turns off, that's different. But if it's just constant playing at some pitch, that square wave, it doesn't actually matter what the, uh, for your hearing, what the, um, if you're doing a sum of sine waves or a sum of cosine waves. And I'd, I'd like to show you this thing here from the Han Academy. Kind of a cool picture. So here is uh, an example of a square wave. First of all, this is a wiggly square wave. Why so wiggly? Well, you have a limited number of partials, right? It has to be band limited anytime you do something digital. If it's not band limited, you're just fooling yourself. So this is a band limited square wave. Um, square waves um, don't have all the harmonics, right? They just got the odd ones. But in any case, uh, if you look at these circles here, um, uh, in the uh, uh, y direction here, if you do the, uh, if you sum up um, <laughs> the outside of, the, I just love this graphic. Um, the outside of the circle, uh, or uh, you get uh, the square wave here, right? And if you switch sines for cosines, then you get this thing, and they sound the same. They look totally different, but they sound identical. So it doesn't matter which one your synthesizer makes. In fact, in the Egan matrix, uh, when we do sawtooth waves with the normal oscillator, there's other ways to make sawtooths that really look like sawtooths, but they're actually the, uh, the harmonic conjugate, as this is called, you know, swap signs for cosines. Does that make any sense? So it is really true that the phase does not matter, but it's under pretty specific conditions. I also earlier said, especially in the attack of a sound, the time domain shape actually matters to your ear. You know, which is nasty, right? Because that's not something that Fourier transforms are great at. I mean, you're going to frequency because you want to look at the frequencies. If you want the time domain shape, what are you doing in frequency domain? Well, frequency domain is useful for other things, but, but uh, the time domain shape actually does matter in attacks. Or another way of saying that is the phase information that you wouldn't normally see in a magnitude spectrum. That phase information certainly matters in attacks of sounds. Are we good? Any questions about this diagram? Right, you're used to having sine on one axis, cosine on the other, you know, and it's just sort of like, uh, I don't know, like phaser stuff or uh, whatever you've seen in the past. But it's, it's a cool looking thing. Now, um, you don't have to swap all your sines for cosines. You can actually make an infinite number of different waveforms that all sound like square waves here. Right, because uh, say uh, you only uh, swap the fundamental and not the other harmonics. Well, then you get a different shape than this pokey shape. Now, you can imagine that when you turn it on, it matters, right? Like, say, for instance, you start in the center. Uh, yeah, I have a mouse here. Yeah. Um, uh, so you start in the center, and you just turn this thing on. You don't ramp it on. You just turn it on. Well, you're going to get more of a click on this one than if you start in the center here, right? Because this one more gradually comes up. So you already know that, yeah, when it turns on or turns off, at least under that extreme condition. I mean, normally you ram things in anyway, but, but under, you know, if you just turn it on, it'll sound different because one will click and one won't, right? You just know that intuitively. So 
uh, okay. Basically, another way to think of that is the derivatives are going to, when you just turn on from going from zero uh, to, to running, the derivatives are more consistent here. Um, uh, there's bigger jumps than the derivatives here. And lots of different ways to think of it, but in any case, you'll hear a click. More sharp corner when you turn that one on. All right? Okay, so. So there's an infinite number of uh, waveforms that all look the same. This is one reason why frequency domain can be extremely useful for many, many things. Because if you just look at the magnitude spectrum of these two, they do look the same. They have the same harmonic strengths. So except for exceptional cases, which are very important. I'm not saying the exceptions don't matter. But except for the exceptional cases, uh, uh, the magnitude you know, spectrum is super, super useful to look at. Questions? How many people have seen this harmonic conjugate stuff before? Okay, yeah. Cool. All right, so I'm going to do a quick dip into long window. Oh, I can't see that at all. That, that projector is actually slightly better for this. Here, let's see here. For those of you out in uh, virtual land, Okay, well, that's pretty horrible. Um, anyway, you can look at your sheet. Um, this is an example of a long window analysis. This is in, in the symbolic sound chemo system. Lots of different ways to dr draw these things. One of the reasons I'm showing you this is just so you can see one of the ways of drawing these things. In this case here, the horizontal axis is time, um, and the vertical axis is frequency. Okay, and then the different colors uh, uh, show how strong various partials are. But this is the result of a, uh, a long window analysis. So we're going to do more details of this later. But I want to, uh, you know, I want to talk about it a little bit because we're going to do the short windows first because they're simpler and uh, more familiar. And it's good to see the various little tricks used in short windows. And they actually have been used a lot. Your first homework paper is a short window analysis. So, you know, it's a useful method. Um, the long window analysis is something that introduces lots of new problems, but at the same time can also do much wider class of sounds. And so that's just an important thing to know. Um, so, wide class of input, including polyphonic. You can't do that with a short window analysis. You cannot do polyphonic. Um, uh, or non-harmonic sounds. When I say non-harmonic, I mean things like, I don't know, like a cymbal crash. Or even something like bells, like alt-gelt bells. There are very clear partials in there. In fact, if you were to dissect it, you can hear two harmonic series there. Unfortunately, when I took this class, uh, Professor Beauchamp at the time uh, mentioned that. And I thought, really? You know, and anyway, I learned to listen for the two harmonic series. And that ruined my enjoyment of alt Bell. So don't do that. But anyway, just take it on faith. There's uh, two harmonic series there, and if you if 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 you want to ruin your Altgal Bell's experience, then you can listen for those two harmonic series, and it doesn't make the music sound very good anymore. Uh, so so I wouldn't advise that. Um, uh, one of many dumb things I've done in my life. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, yeah, uh, there's um, uh, you know. Um, this does a wide class of sounds. The problem is you have a long window. And long window means long in time, right? Long window means that it's going to cover a lot, a lot of time being like, I don't know, as much as a quarter second, or at least a tenth of a second. And within a tenth of a second, a lot of stuff can happen. Right? A lot of the sound can change a lot. So you have this problem of poor time resolution. You get temporal smearing. Huge problem. And you don't have that with the short window analysis. So, you know, uh, one reason to look at this is like, hey, uh, at least I don't have that problem. Um, so uh, uh, the uh, temporal smearing is a very serious problem. It just means that, you know, if you mush everything out and sort of average over a quarter second, your assumption generally is that, well, during one window, the sound doesn't change much. A quarter second is forever, though. If you, if you, I mean, that whole trumpet note we studied in the first thing was only a quarter second long. So if you say, oh, it doesn't change much, well, that sort of disses that whole thing. Uh, so you've got to be real careful. Now, it is possible to analyze things like that trumpet tone with it, but it, it's a lot of work. Um, 
So poor time resolution, temporal smearing, um, and then uh, just in general, artifacts is always problems. Like artifacts, if, if you were uh, 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 digging a historic site, an artifact might be something you want to find. Uh, in uh, electronic music, artifact is bad. Uh, it's like a four-letter word. Um, and it means something that is really due to your math or your analysis method or something, but it's not part of the original thing. It's, it's fabricated by your, uh, by your process uh, and unintentional. So um, what is this here? This is a cry crying baby. In lecture one, I don't know if you remember, we had a crying baby and what, a yowling cat. Well, this is just the crying baby. Um, uh, uh, from that example that, that uh, uh, symbolic sound did uh, for some Smearmouth ad, I think, in Britain. I don't know. Uh, something like that. Well, actually, I, I don't think symbolic sound made the analyses and such. I think they, uh, uh, but their system was used for that ad by a British sound designer. So um, uh, there's qu various questions here. Is this easy to manipulate? Uh, well, yes and no. You know, you have individual partials here. You can see things like here is, 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 is a nice harmonic part of the sound. It's very hard to see on, on the uh, thing there. But anyway, uh, a harmonic part of the sound. You can see um, equally spaced uh, partials there, right? And then there's just sort of this thing in between where the uh, uh, baby is glorking and trying to get its, uh, uh, trying to catch its breath again. And then it starts whang again, and then some more. So you can see the, the um, uh, pitched parts or, or the parts where, where uh, you have the baby cry that is very hard to ignore, um, and then uh, the other things. There's also interesting things here. I, I mentioned this over here. Uh, well, I can't see it now. But um, if you look at uh, the trajectories here uh, in the vowel parts of the sound, in the, uh, in the pitched parts, Look at the high frequencies versus the low. I mentioned this before because we were talking about, well, how well can you hear uh, uh, pitch? And then, you know, at very low frequencies, your pitch accuracy is actually very poor. But look at the fundamental here. You can barely see that it wiggles. But if you look at one of the high partials here, you can really see the details of that baby cry, right? Because by the time you're looking at the 15th harmonic, every variation that's in the fundamental is going to be 15 times as big. This being a linear frequency axis, you can really see it here, right? So that's a very important thing to keep in mind because we're talking about pitch accuracy. And you always have to be careful when you're doing, um, looking at psychoacoustic data about pure tones or about uh, pure sine waves. Uh, keep in mind they're pure sine waves. And when you listen to, I don't care, even a synthesized thing, a square wave, uh, you got lots of harmonics. Any small variation in frequency um, in the fundamental that you actually couldn't hear for a pure sine wave, you can hear because of the harmonics. Okay, and that's super, super important. So it's one of the ways, I mean, because, you know, your hearing, your pitch sense is by far the most accurate sense you have. Many orders of magnitude more accurate than anything else you can do. But there's lots of weird reasons for that. You know, it's not a simple thing. Has anybody here um, studied hearing systems? No, okay. There's actually a lot of cool new stuff there, like, you know, there's things we've known for a long time, like that I talk about here, but also just that actually... Um, that your hearing system will actually generate images, a series of images, so it's actually a lot like your seeing system. Uh, it's a two-dimensional analysis. They're using a lot of the same mechanisms that you use in seeing um, to uh, figure out what you're hearing and to help get all this crazy accuracy. So there are a lot of really cool things. turns out that seeing and hearing are, are more related, uh, or the machinery is more related than you might think. Um, okay. Anyway, that, that's either here or there. We're just talking about these things. Um, so uh, there are some various uh, concerns here. Um, let's see if I can make it so that you can read the other scroll I have on here. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, so uh, yeah, look at the harmonics. You know, that's kind of cool. Um, also of concern is the time domain shapes of attacks and transients. Now, this baby cry is going to be pretty disturbing even if the time domain shape isn't exactly right, because it's not a real sharp attack. I mean, when it's sort of catching its breath and choking a bit, um, you know, there, this was perfectly uh, disturbing enough as a, as, as a uh, having been a, a parent myself um, uh, of, of, of small children, but uh, perfectly disturbing enough. So in this case, it really did fine. But in general, this particular representation doesn't preserve phase information. 
And there are some cases where you can hear that. Um, they're rare, but that doesn't mean they're non-existent. Uh, I had mentioned this up here. Uh, some, uh, I used to do a bassoon example at this point, where I play a bassoon sound for you, and in the sustain, if you really listen to it carefully, there's some clickiness of the bassoon that was missing. But in a room like this, nobody could hear it. You know, it just wasn't a useful demonstration because it's so close. And even if you have headphones on, I think part of it is if you're a bassoon player, you certainly hear it. You'd say, oh, this sounds mushy. You know, it sounds like a wet rag. Um, but it's pretty subtle. <laughs> you know, so, so it is just not a useful demonstration. But uh, take my word for it, um, uh, phase information is a pain because it rarely is very uh, noticeable. But... Uh, but it's that last little bit that makes the difference uh, in many high quality sounds. Questions? All right, so those are long windows. A uh, quick introduction. We're going to do a lecture and a half on long windows and then the problems and how to try to fix the, get around the problems. And it's actually very cool stuff. But for now, we're just going to do the short window analysis. So, short window, time-varying spectral analysis. The trumpet paper, the homework window is an example. Technical terms. The first one is super, super important. It says pitch synchronous. So what does that mean? That means that you need to know the pitch period. But more fundamentally, that means there has to be a pitch period. So you, you don't need to know it to 50 points of, uh, decimal points of accuracy. But if you have a 440 hertz note, you need to know it's a 440 hertz note. And if a person is actually playing 438 hertz or, or if there's vibrato and it changes over time, that's fine. It needs to be quasi-harmonic, but it needs to be, you need to know close to what the pitch period is. Well, immediately, that will cut out um, polyphonic sounds, right? Because you've got several instruments playing. There isn't a pitch period. You can't analyze that with this. So what this is really useful for is just individual notes. And you know what? That's a huge percentage of electronic music what we'll ever analyze. Because you start with individual notes and you mess with them lots of different ways and um, you synthesize all sorts of stuff. So I'm not putting it down. Um, uh, in fact, if you can get away with it, this kind of analysis is, is just way easier. It's going to be way less hassle. And you'll, uh, it, you, you know, if it's a homebrew thing and you make it yourself, you'll probably implement it slightly different than anybody else ever has because there's too many little things you can change. But, you know, it, it'll work. Um, so... Uh, what is good about um, this? Uh, so you need pitch synchronous, which is a limitation, but but um, uh, you need good uh, you get good time resolution out of it. Why? Because we're going to use the shortest possible window. Does anybody remember from ECE three ten? What's the shortest possible window you can use? That's any good? I mean, not a square window. That doesn't count. Do you remember like the Hanning window or Hamming window? Do you remember how many periods that is? I don't know if they really talked about that. Anyway, it's two periods. And that's the best you can do. You can't do, you know, one period windows. Well, the only one there is is a square window, and you get way, way lots of problems. If you do two period windows, um, you still have, you know, s problems related to what was happening in the square window, but it is so much less that it doesn't matter much. Okay, so um, you're limited to monophonic sounds. Uh, so, and, and the biggest effect of this is try to record without reverb. Like, uh, you know, if you have too echoey a sound, it might be monophonic, but because there's reflections all the time, it isn't really, you know. You, uh, so, you, you, a lot of the sounds sound kind of icky and dry, uh, you know, not pretty because you don't have reverb in them, but that's okay. You can add a reverb later. You know, do your processing and stuff and then add the reverb. So that's that. Um, and they got to be quasi-harmonic. What do I mean by that? They don't have to be strictly harmonic, like a sawtooth or something, but they should be close. It turns out that covers most, you know, most woodwinds, strings, uh, brass, you know, sustained instruments, even things like drums. Uh, now, a drum is, you know, a um, two-dimensional vibra vibrating surface, as you know from... Uh, I don't know what differential equations are from somewhere, uh, is best described by Bessel functions, not a, not a sum of sine waves. So it is true that it's not a very uh, harmonic thing to begin with, but that's just the excitation. Most drums have a body, a resonant body, 
that brings out all the harmonics. So yes, the attack isn't harmonic, but the rest of it is. And actually, to a lesser extent, in every instrument that's true. Until you have a standing wave set up, you never have uh, uh, a uh, harmonic sound right at the beginning. But you can still treat it as such. The vast majority of the sound is harmonic. And as long as uh, you have good enough time resolution, uh, you can often get away with it. So it has to be quasi-harmonic or, or, you know, almost harmonics. It can't just be uh, uh, totally off. Uh, for instance, alt-gal bells, that, that won't work too good. Uh, you know, uh, you got to do something different with them. Uh, you get short window artifacts. Everything has artifacts. So what are the artifacts in short window? The, the biggest things are crosstalk. So like if your third harmonic is super loud and in the original sound, your fourth harmonic was absolutely quiet. You'll usually, I mean, unless the phase of the moon is perfect for you, you'll usually still get a little bit of energy in the fourth harmonic. And in fact, if you use a crummy window, if you use a square window, you get so much crosstalk that the analysis isn't very useful. So don't do that. But if you use, you know, a raised cosine window, um, uh, the crosstalk will be limited. The crosstalk will be worse if your frequency estimate is way off. So, you know, the different harmonics will bleed into each other. Some. Now, so the crosstalk is a little bit of a concern. On the other hand, in any real acoustic system, there's already some bleeding over between the things. So, so you know, if you're doing at least acoustic sounds, well, it isn't as big a deal as you think, as long as you don't have a horrible window. As long as you're not using a square window. It's one of the reasons why we go with two-period windows instead of three-period windows. Three-period windows would have um, more side bad compression. You know, they'd be yet better, but they're also longer. They have more time smearing and stuff. So, eh, go for the extreme. Go for a two-period window. You know, Han or Hamming window or whatever they're called. We good? So you got crosstalk, and then you get ripple effects. What are these ripple effects? Well, this might be related to the crosstalk. Let's say you have a vibrato going. And uh, when you have a vibrato going, you know, your pitch is going up and down. So your crosstalk characteristics and stuff are going to change a bit. So that's one possible source of these ripple effects. There's other ones. Um, it might just be how you're interacting with the sample rate and the pitch you've got, it's got um, oh, all sorts of funny things. Uh, but anyway, there's, uh, these are usually pretty minor things. Uh, if they're really major, you, your algorithm is probably just broken. But this is a short algorithm. You can write this up in you know, 15 lines of code. So that's kind of cool. So um, for the uh, uh, rest of this lecture, I'm going to talk about the few formulas at the bottom there, which are just a Fourier series. It turns out Fourier transforms are great, but if you're doing short windows, you, you don't get much gain on You know, the n log n uh, features uh, uh, order of uh, um, uh, Fourier transforms doesn't gain you much on short things. So usually people just do Fourier series for this. Uh, it's got to be really fast on a modern computer no matter what. So um, I do want to say something here. So the approximation we make here is that, well, your spectrum won't change much during a two-period window. And that's generally pretty true. You know, in the attack, you might get fast changes. But after that, you, your spectrum isn't going to change insanely during two-period windows. So we sort of make that our, our assumption. What we're going to do is, um, maybe I will back out a little bit here. Um, on the bottom here, I've got these equations, the a sub n, b sub n, that's just Fourier series. And then we have a magnitude equation and a phase equation. Uh, you've seen all this stuff before. You may have forgotten it some. But I want to talk about it. Ask me questions if there is, uh, you know, questions about it. I just want to go through it. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, you got coffee still? Good, good. You know, stay awake. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, I'll go with it. But but go ahead and interrupt and ask questions. Sometimes I get so excited about things, I'm not paying attention, just, just yell. Okay. Um, so, well, the, I've got these equations down here, and up here I've got um, just a description of what the variables are. This S of t, of, uh, uh, t here um, is the input signal to be analyzed, where T is a sample number. So T is time in units of 1 over SR seconds, or it's a sample number. Okay, so we'll do t as an integer here. You could do t in seconds or milliseconds or some other units, but we're just going to go with sample number. So that's s of t. Um, then you've got h of i as a two-period window. Okay, so now we've got to be a little bit careful here. 
um, two period window, uh, two n long hand window is, is is what I was using. Doesn't matter. Any you know the raised cosine. There's only two choices, so pick one. Um, but um, uh, two n long hand window, and uh, so. What happens here, if you look at the sum here, like say for, uh, this is a Fourier series, so this is uh, uh, the sine coefficient, the cosine coefficient equation here, which you've seen at some point in your life. Um, notice the integral here goes from minus n to n. Why? Well, it's a two period window. It's centered um, at t, and you're going from minus n to n, so, so the one period is to the left of t, and the other period is to the right of t. And you don't need to sum outside of that, because that's why you're doing a window function, so that you zero out everything beyond the end of the windows. All right. So, um, uh, so you've got um, n here uh, is the input period rounded to the nearest integer. Now that's a first warning, and this is you know you're going to get artifacts from different places, but this is one thing that is pretty serious, right? You have some sample rate, and you're going to round. Uh, 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 the input signal period to an integer. And that's never actually exactly true, right? Your, your input period will always be some crooked number of samples. But it doesn't matter. For this analysis, we do, we always round it to an integer. So even if you have an exactly repeating waveform, like you made a sawtooth out of a synthesizer and, or out of a signal generator, and it's exactly repeating, um, still, your pitch estimate's going to be off because you have to round to the nearest integer number of samples. And unless you very carefully picked your frequency, which is sort of a non-issue. Again, I've mentioned this before, it's kind of like if you're going to flip a coin, you know, you say heads or tails, you never say sides. Theoretical, it might be possible to land on a side. I mean, you can balance a coin on its side, so you know it's possible, but it's so unlikely you don't, <laughs> you don't go for that. Um, so um, the N is always rounded in integer. So no matter what, um, you, you, you know, the pitch estimate you have here is, is, isn't going to be correct. But it's going to be really close. And that's the whole thing about quasi-harmonic. You know, it, nothing has to be exact. In fact, you want to be able to analyze sounds that have vibrato in them, where the pitch barrier is changing a little bit. But um, uh, the, the trick there is a little bit. You, you, you know, you're, it's not sliding over octaves or anything. Are we good? OK. So. Um, N is a pitch period, F is frequency uh, corresponding though now to the rounded N. So F, just be a little careful with that, that's fundamental frequency. Really it's the window frequency, we sometimes call that, but it's, uh, it, it's the rounded off frequency. Um, N in these equations here is partial number, there's A sub N and B sub N. So what does that mean? Well, you're taking uh, for the fundamental, right, you have two sine waves and two periods in uh, for the uh, uh, first partial above that, or the first harmonic or quasi-harmonic, uh, you have four periods and so forth. So if you just look at the equation, that's just the multiplier in here for, uh, um, for your sine and your cosine. A sub n is the sine coefficient. Um, again, it's for partial n, for the nth uh, component, at, sine, at time t, where t is the center. And we always do this with windowing things. We say, OK, all this stuff is happening at the center. Because you want to give some time when you say, this is the spectrum. Of course, in a sense, that doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. What's a, cent and a spectrum at a time instant? I mean, a spectrum, you're asking, well, what is the frequency content? And you can't have frequency content at an instant of time. It doesn't make any sense. You need, you know, you need time to have those different frequencies uh, oscillate. So we're really just centering. We're saying, OK, this is the spectrum at this time. Uh, it's sort of weird wording, but that's what we're saying. It's a sort of instantaneous, here's the spectrum here, and then um, a period later, we'll also have another point where we say, this is the spectrum here, and you can look at the spectrum and see how it changes period to period. But that's really just, where is the data centered? Okay. Does it make any sense so far? Sound okay? Okay. So, um, uh, we got a sine coefficient, both sine, uh, you know, cosine coefficient, amplitude envelope for partial n at time t, that's just a sub n. This is your usual magnitude equation, you're familiar with this. Um, and uh, then you have a phase value and you're familiar with that. And uh, then you, but what we really want, I put it in bold face here, the final answer we want is an amplitude envelope. Okay. So we now want to know how does each partial change over time. 
you know, the nth partial, a sub n, uh, the fifth partial, let's say, how does it change over time? And uh, so we have that there. Then we're going to get, out of the phase information, we're going to get the frequency envelope, too. We want to know what is its frequency over time. Um, and in the end here, we have this thing called a hop size. What is that about? Well, a hop size is just how much do we increment t? Like, we're going to do a windowed thing, do an analysis, get the spectrum, get this data out of it. And then we're going to move over, move the window over, window the next part of the sound. And it turns out for hop size, we just go over one period. Lots of, and you can prove things about that, but also you, you just don't gain anything by going over one sample or something. You just generate lots of extra data, which doesn't do any good. So, so uh, let's skip that. Um, so we go over one period. So, what are the actual steps in really doing this short window analysis? Well, first of all, there's this little side comment here I want. Oh, okay, yeah, so hop size is n, is one period. Um, it's 50% overlap. Uh, that, it's just, I say usually, I don't know. I don't know why else, what you would do different. Certainly the, the paper you read did this too. Um, so 50% overlap, that means you have two period window and you move it over by one period each time. Or in other words, you get a spectrum for each period. Which does mean that if you're playing lower notes, well, two things happen. You get more harmonics, because you've got a longer Fourier series you're doing, right? Um, on the other hand, um, uh, uh, you, uh, in fact, you see it here, all right, one uh, is less than or equal to n, is less than or equal to n over two. Why is that? Well, if you, you know, as you know from your Fourier series or Fourier transform, you need, uh, if you've got n data points, you get n over two uh, sine and cosine coefficients or magnitudes and phases out. So, um, so, so that makes sense. Um, uh, so you're going to uh, move over, uh, if you have a lower frequency, on the one hand, you get more harmonics. On the other hand, you also get less data, le you know, get data less often, right? Because your frequency is longer, so your hops are bigger. In the end, the total amount of data you get is the same. It's just sort of divided up different. More of it's in the spectrum information, less of it is in, in sort of uh, temporal snapshots. Okay, so here are the steps for uh, short window analysis. First, you do pitch detection. This is usually really, really, really easy. You ask the user, you know, the trumpet player, you ask them, ah, what, did, what, you know, what did you play? And then ah, low C sharp, and you figure out what the frequency that is, and you're done. Uh, and of course, n is derived from that, from your sample rate, and to the nearest integer. Then you select a window. Again, don't waste a long time with this. Just use a two-period hand window. Uh, you only got two choices that, that are commonly used for two-period windows. Um, it's got to be a raised cosine as you learned in 310, so the only uh, options are hand or ham. Um, and uh, yeah, so you select the window, that's easy. Uh, the hop size, you just make it one period. Uh, so, so far this is really easy. Now you complete, compute the amplitude and phase for each window. Uh, we also call these things grains. I put a little comment up here too. In electronic music, um, a short windowed section of something is often called a grain of sound. So we have the idea of partial, which is one frequency component, and then we have idea of grain, which is just a short time domain windowed thingy. And there's even, you know, just like there's additive sine wave synthesis, there's also granular synthesis, where you add up little grains of sound. We'll talk about that later in class. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, you compute amplitude and phase for each window here. Once you've done that, now to get the amplitude envelope is really easy. You just string together all the amplitude values you got at each window. So for the third partial, if you want its amplitude envelope, you look, what was it in the first, you know, what was the third partial in the first uh, Fourier series and the next Fourier series, the next Fourier series, you just go through them all, string them together, do linear interpolation between those, you're done. Super, super easy. So the only other tricky thing, and it's not even that tricky, but how do you figure out the accurate frequency? Because you do want to be able to uh, have vibrato, right? This thing, I said it has to be quasi-harmonic, but it doesn't have to be strictly engineering sense locked harmonics. It just needs to be close. Um, and uh, again, if you think in 310, you can think of the frequency domain representation of your window function, right? It's got side lobes. And you don't want to get too loud side lobes. I mean, if you're way off of center, then you start getting uh, more problems there. But, but uh, uh, as long as you're reasonably close, it, it, it's going to be good enough. 
but you still, you want frequency information. All you have so far is you know you did your analysis with n rounded to the nearest integer. And you really want now to see, OK, with the vibrato that the person did, and possibly with this harmonic. Is this harmonic just a little bit off from the others? Uh, or, or, or whatever else is going on, you want to get frequency information. So how does that work? Well, you have phase information in each window. And you have this wonderful formula here. Uh, the frequency at time t is n times the fundamental frequency f. Now, this is based on that integer n, right? This is your analysis fundamental frequency or your window frequency. So um, be aware of that. This is uh, not this is some um, integer number of sa uh, based on some integer number of samples plus the derivative of your phase information for phase that partial. So what does this mean? Let's just look at one sine wave. In, in this case, I'm just going to make it the fundamental because it makes it easy. But this works for any sine wave. Let's say your window spacing or your n, your estimate, you know, your, the, the frequency that your analysis assumed is exactly right. Well, you're going to have each period uh, or each window, you're going to have this partial at the same phase, right? This is always at the same constant phase value. But now let's say, uh, for instance, uh, let's say your, your note's actually lower than you thought. Or say you're in a vibrato cycle where it's shifted down, right? So this will happen. This isn't just an oops or something. This is fundamentally part of the analysis. Um, well, now what happens is um, by the time you expect the next period, you're actually not there yet. And then by the time you expect the period after that, you're even short of that. So what's happening here is your phase value um, is getting more and more negative. This is totally exaggerated here, of course, because if, if I didn't totally exaggerate it, there'd be nothing to see. But, but you, you see what I'm talking about? Right? Your phase value is going more and more negative because your estimated n is, is not what you actually have in this, uh, 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 in this partial. So you have this simple formula here. Uh, you have uh, phase plus the derivative. Um, uh, 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 I'm sorry, frequency, um, n times the frequency, so whatever harmonic you got, it's going to be n times the fundamental plus n times whatever your phase change is. And that's it. That's how you do frequency correction. Right, so for this one here, the phase is going more and more negative, so this will actually decrease the capital F sub n than if the phase were constant all the time. So in that way, it can tell that your frequency is off. Does this make any sense? Sort of? This is probably the least familiar part of this because the rest of the stuff you might have seen elsewhere. But, but, so again, the idea is that if your capital N were really one period, you're moving over your window every period. So um, every window, you would have the same phase value for whatever harmonic you're looking at, for the partial you're looking at. But if your N is wrong, your phase is going to be, say your n, uh, in this case, is uh, uh, your n is too small, you're going to get phases that go more and more negative. Sorry. Uh, yeah, n is too small. If n is too big, you're going to get phases that go more and more positive. So it will automate, you know, th th this formula here, by looking at the derivative of a phase, uh, you will correct. Clear as mud. So it's something to think about. This is actually sort of a useful concept, and it may come up in other, you know, one of the things in engineering is that uh, it's a myth that anybody ever does anything new. What people do is they notice something in one area that, you know, knowledge from another area they bring in and, and notice, hey, look at this. And, and that can be super useful. So this kind of stuff, even though you probably won't do exactly this later in your life, um, just having seen this and seeing this idea uh, may very well uh, turn out to be useful elsewhere. So, um, uh, yeah, so you get this frequency correction from the phase values. Basically, your phase would be constant every period if your frequency estimate were exactly right. And for parts of your sound, it may be very close. But for parts of your sound, it may not be. And then this will correct. This will also make up for the fact that, hey, you have uh, integer period lengths, because your window has to be some integer number of samples long. I mean, you've got to pick something. And uh, so, and this will make up for that. Because your frequency at hearing accuracy, of course, is way better than to one sample. I mean, one sa you know, if you had a pitch accuracy of to one sample for a pitch period, it, things would be very out of tune.
All right? Well, um, I guess I wish you uh, the best on the exam. Again, you'll, you should have plenty of time on the exam, but you know, please set your alarms. Be, uh, uh, be up at 8. If you have trouble, then you'll have time to figure it out. Um, if you're insanely sick or something, uh, you know, don't, don't kill yourself doing it. Um, we can work something out. But if, if at all possible, please uh, take the exam at the normal time. Thank you very much. Oh, I like dumb questions. I've had people answer it then. Um, okay, so there's this question, can you do this in real time? Actually, this is a lot closer to real time than most FFT algorithms. So it, this is an important thing to know, too, about short window and long window. FFTs are super computationally efficient, and in that sense can be real time. The problem for an FFT is, before you can do the FFT, you've got to collect all these samples. So, you know, if you've got a uh, FFT to say that's 2048 long, that's a lot of samples. You know, that's a long delay just filling the FFT buffer. Even if you can process it super fast, you're still filling it. So, so there's this idea of serialized algorithms. So the idea being that you get one sample in, you do something with it, one sample out, and you can actually serialize this. Uh, so there's more you can do, but you can kind of see here this has to have at least a one period delay. There's, or, or two periods, depending on how you think of it. But, but, you know, but still, that's a pretty short delay compared to what most things have. Um, there's even faster things you can do with bandpass filters and stuff. Usually those aren't really faster, uh, but they could be. Like one thing that can happen, and there's also different ways of tiling. Um, we don't want to get into that, but things besides Fourier spectrums uh, where you can do the higher frequencies with shorter windows, basically, than the lower frequencies. Right? You can use, uh, uh, there's different ways to tile the spectrum. In my experience, those haven't been real important. But uh, you know that that's that sort of depends. So a lot of it really depends on can you deal with delays, um, and and the delays aren't due to they're just due to real world things, you know. You're you're uh, but uh, yes, this you can actually make real time. But there are also real time FFT based things. You know, they just try to use the shortest FFT possible, and you know, and you have some delay. Uh, some musicians are very used to that. If you're a pipe organist in a big cathedral, often. People are very far away from you, and you have to anticipate, right? You have to play notes early or late, uh, depending on who's listening and, and who you are, uh, right, to, 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 uh, to really play synchronous with people. But yeah, you got to learn those skills if you want to use it in real time. Cool? Thank you, guys. This one here? Yeah, I Yeah, um, so, okay, so, so the first thing is, um, oh, would you just like to take pictures? Yeah. Uh, um, why don't I just let you take some pictures, and then we'll talk about this. Sure, sure, sure. And anybody else, if you want to take uh, pictures of it, that's, that's uh, good. Sure. Um, okay, so I'm going to do this over here because there may be somebody in virtual land that that didn't uh, ask, right? And this way they can sort of see it maybe if they care. Um, uh, okay, so uh, uh, what happens here is don't worry about this being the bigger picture. Uh, just worry about first the concept here of what the phase is doing. If you have a sine wave going, say it's out of a sine wave generator, it's, you know, don't think of a that is part of uh, this analysis. So you have a sine wave going, and um, you look n samples later. If n is that period of that sine wave, then here you're going to have the same phase value as here, and the same phase value as there. But it's just going to stay constant. So that's sort of clear, right? Now, if you um, if n is not the period of the thing, then it, it'll either have done more than a period or less than a period n samples later, so your phase value is going to change all the time. Okay, and your phase value is going to change faster depending on how much your n is off. I mean, if your n is off by just a little bit, then your phase values change slowly, but they change. Um, if uh, n is off by a lot, then uh, the n values will change, uh, I mean, the phase values will change faster. Uh, 
So in some fundamental way, I mean, one of the most important things in you know this stuff is to have just to believe that it could be true. So it, it sort of makes sense that uh, uh, f plus uh, the derivative, or maybe it'd be f minus. I mean, you'd have to figure out which one of those. But but that 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 the the derivative of uh, the phase or how the phase is changing gives you the total frequency, okay. right? Because um, if the if phase isn't changing at all, then you know you got the right frequency already. But this is sort of a correction factor for the frequency. Oh, okay. I see. So 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 that that part of it sort of makes sense. Now to prove yourself that this is a plus instead of a minus, you just have to take an example. What I did here is I took an example. I'm looking n later, and the phase is going more and more negative, and you can just see well you know that th this this uh, uh, sine wave here is lower frequency than what we expected. So a plus is right, because n is going, you know, theta pr uh, prime sub n is, is negative. So then there's another thing in here. There's this factor of n. What the heck is that? Well, what we're showing here is n equals 1. It's just one period. But say you have two periods in here. Um, then, you know, the, the, uh, the phase, you're only checking every two periods. So you have to multiply everything by two. Basically, your, your phase changes twice as, uh, twice as much frequency change as it was for the fundamental and for the third one it's three times as much and you can sort of believe that right I mean basically say you have zero phase change here you know you got to multiply frequency by n right um, now do you you know for the nth harmonic uh, but you also have to multiply the correction by n and yeah it's sort of believable there's also something else sort of fundamental here that makes this believable and that's that in general right say you have any signal that you're describing if you're looking at its phase change, well, how fast the phase change, that's, by definition, the frequency. Right? Because phase and frequency are sort of defined in that way, right? You know, uh, or uh, uh, if you have, uh, you know, say you have something at some sample rate, and your phase is, is zero, and then the phase is uh, 10 degrees, and 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, that's going to be a higher frequency than if we're zero, and then 7 degrees, and then 14 degrees, and then you know, you, you sort of know that it's, well, how your phase changes, that's just how far, you're, how fast you're going through the waveform. So if, you, uh, if you're going through the waveform faster, you have bigger phase changes, or the derivative of a phase is related to frequency. Um, same way of saying that. Cool? Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, you too, thanks. Uh-uh. <sighs> 